Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to another episode of Explode Your Expert Business Show. This is the podcast for experts who want to become the ultimate authorities in their industry and while making an impact in the world. Um, we are with you every week, a few times a week, sometimes with episodes with incredible guests like today. Uh, sometimes we interview clients as case studies and as well as solo episodes where I share some of the behind the scene of the things that I do uh, in the business. If it's the first time that you're listening, welcome. If you're coming back because you're a regular, welcome again. And uh, as well, if you have not yet downloaded uh, one of our free resources, which is the expert business checklist, make sure you do it right now. Now, sometimes running a business as a coach, speaker, or trainer can be very confusing. You don't know where to start. Uh, someone tells you to do X, someone tells you to do Y, someone else tells you to do Z, and then you get all confused. And I just want to bring you some clarity because depending on where you are in your business, there are different things you should be focusing on. And uh, in the resource that we have we give you, there is a full assessment where you can say where you are at and what you should be focusing on based on the business that you run and your level of expertise. So make sure you click the link in the show notes and download it right now, which is the expert business checklist. Also, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet to the show, make sure you subscribe straight away and uh, let us know if you like the show at the end with a review. Having said that, it's time to introduce uh, our guest today, uh, which I can say like is someone, uh, uh, if we put like a side, uh, each other side by side, we actually look pretty similar. And I think he has some Italian origin somewhere, somehow. Um, is uh, Anthony Steers uh, is better known as the telephone assassin. Is on a mission to give people uh, the the big to get businesses talking again and stopping people from hiding behind the emails. Uh, so that uh, is a thing. Uh, welcome, Anthony, to the show. Good to see you here. Thank you very much, Simone. Lovely to uh, lovely to be here. My uh, curly haired brother from another mother. As so like we're we're you. going to talk we're going to talk about sales today. It's all about picking the phone up, and uh, we are going to talk about how uh, like how to get rid of resistances from this and what to say practically. I'm excited about this conversation because a lot of people they 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 are afraid <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of of the phone, right? <laughs> yeah, this this phone phobia thing. Well, I think that there's so many ways, to, so many other platforms and ways that you can hide from making a phone call. So emails, websites, funnels is another one that uh, we've talked about before. Um, yeah, people seem to, to mm. <laughs> yeah, find it easier to send a message. It is, it is, it is a way of hiding. So we're going to talk about that because at the end of the day, you will get clients when you get a conversation. Absolutely. Uh, and what I typically say is with an email and lots of other digital messages that you send, that gets it off your desk. It usually doesn't complete the task. It requires a conversation to find out what actions are going to happen uh, to be able to move forwards. So that's why it's crucial. I, I love that. Yeah? I love that. And, and at the moment, everybody's locked down. And although we have the beauty that is Zoom that has saved us, um, People are craving conversation and appreciating a phone call. You don't even need to be smart from the waist up to answer the phone, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so before we talk about sales, let's talk about something important. What products do you use for your curly hair? <laughs> <laughs> let's get started with it. Let's, let's get straight to the crux. Let's of get it. straight uh, to the yeah, crux. I normally, at the, at the end of my speeches, when I do a Q&A, I say, I'll t I will answer the most common questions now. And that is uh, 38 and no. It's how old are you and is that a perm? Um, it does naturally do this, but I do use a product called Kerastis Oleo Curl, which is the uh, fantastic product for anybody who is blessed or cursed with this curly kind of barnet. <laughs> so we actually use a different one. Ah, oh, so what are you using, Simone? Because you look quite smart, and particularly when we have this kind of hairdo, wearing a suit, it's a risky combination, right? It is, it is. And uh, I am blessed that actually, <laughs> my, my wife is Caribbean, <laughs> and I use uh, Caribbean black hair products <laughs> for, my, <laughs> for my curly hair, and it's a brand called Cantu. Yeah. Which I never heard before, because it's uh, like typical for like black hair care. Yeah. Uh, but in the black community, it's very well known. Yeah, yeah. 
and I've started it because uh, she, we well, have it in, in the bathroom and my hair responded incredibly well to it. I was going to say, you are rocking it. Maybe I need to uh, I need to give it a go. Somebody I've had a, I've had two people now refer to it as COVID curls. They think, oh, <laughs> do you just massively need a haircut? And it's like, well, it does look kind of like this normally. But yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So uh, we're going to put actually the hair product in the resources in the show notes, just in case we have some more curly hair listeners right now, Absolutely. <laughs> no matter their ethnicity or their background. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you've got, if you've got curls, we love you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you don't. We still love you. We still love, okay. And I, was just, I was expecting you to say, no, we don't. <laughs> it's like, get off the podcast right now. We love everybody. All right, so let's talk about sales. Uh, how did you get involved uh, into having this uh, morbid relationship with the phone? Well, I think it all started with my first job because when I left school, I knew I was going to go into sales um, because I wasn't very clever, but I like to talk a lot. Um, and I decided that I wanted to sell the most expensive thing ever so I could earn the biggest commission. So don't hold it against me, but I was an estate agent. I was selling houses when I, I sort of left school uh, and I did it for, for about four and a half years and I really worked my way up. I was one of the youngest valuers in our area. It was, it was great. Um, but one of the things that happened um, on one of the appointments where I was valuing a property, uh, and bear in mind, I covered, um, I, I worked in the Bracknell office, which isn't the most expensive of areas, but we we actually border onto Ascot, which most mm -hmm. people will have heard of, is rather nice to, to live in and very expensive housing. And I remember um, I, I'd finished an appointment with an elderly couple, and as I was leaving, I'd done what I would normally do, and I'd got on quite well with them, but I did what usually happened. I gave them one of the lowest prices because I was being honest and I gave them one of the highest fees because we were the best. We owned Rightmove at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And as I left, uh, the, the, the wife was quite pleasant and they both sort of saw me to the door and she said, oh, lovely to meet you. Uh, and he just went, oh yes, nice to meet you. And then just as he was about to close the door, he said, what does that kid know? And he shut the door. And I remember as I drove up onto their drive, the owner of the, the competing estate agent was driving off because it was like an in and out drive in his Jaguar. OK, <laughs> they'd sent out the owner and they've got me. And I like to think I look quite youthful. And I basically went back to the office and my manager went, so when's it coming on? And I said, it's not. And she said, what do you mean? And I explained kind of what had happened. And it was brilliant. She said, well, I suggest you prove you're not a kid before you get there next time. And I went, brilliant. How do you do that? And she said, and that's what you need to figure out. And what I did figure out was that if anybody had ever booked an appointment for me, if, um, if so that the first time I met them wasn't at their house, um, what I'd actually do is I would always try and phone people and have a telephone conversation before I did a face to face. So when I met them, typically what most people used to say was, oh, you're younger than I expected which all of a sudden I could take as a compliment rather than you look young and inexperienced. Um, so I think that's kind of what set me on my journey to realize and, and being told that a state agency is not the most loved profession. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you, and if you put your mind to it, it's really easy to stand out. Yeah. I kind of just tried to apply that really. I, I love it. How did you take it that when, when you actually got that feedback, did, did, did you immediately went into, Oh yeah. Okay. Let me figure it out. Or it was like, um if i'm honest with you i kind of i remember coming home and and be you know one of those nights where your other half's going are you okay and you go yeah i'm fine i'm fine and you're just kind of mulling it over and you're thinking well what is it that i can actually do to mm. prove i'm not a kid and it, it literally that evening i was like well there's nothing i really i can do other than maybe have a conversation with them before i meet them it, it was the only logical thing and i, I think jane my manager at the time knew that she didn't want to tell me what to do. She wanted me to figure out why I needed to do that thing. Um, and it just really stuck with me. And uh, yeah, like I say, I was one of the youngest valuers in the area. I had the, one of the highest fees, um, average fees in, in the company. Um, yeah, it just, yeah, it was one of the jobs that I said, if I ever went back and got a proper job, and when I say proper job, I, if I was to go and get employed again, because I could be unemployable now, um, that's probably one of the professions that I would go back to, because it's such a, it's the biggest purchase of people's lives, and actually good agents get on very well with their clients. There's just a lot of bad agents out there that 
a bit like bankers have given the profession a bit of a bad name. Is there uh, something in particular that uh, you like in the, uh, like as an estate agent in the, um, in the housing industry? Uh, is there something that like, what is particular that you like about that? I'm curious. Um, well, one of the things that I did when I was there, I said I worked my way up through the agency. So when I started, I, I used to spend a lot of time at the franking machine at the back, the post machine, or folding leaflets and going uh, sort of leaflet dropping. Uh, as I'd worked my way up, um, I ended up taking over the sales progression. So looking after the sale, once the deal's been agreed, you've actually got to get surveys done, searches done, all the fixes and fittings forms, you need to make sure you've got to try and orchestrate all of this stuff because deals fall through and nobody gets paid unless it exchanges contracts and then completes. Um, and I started to realize that once I started the sales progression, the number of deals that we had that fell through massively dropped and the average time of a deal going through was going down as well. So actually I figured, well, you lose less deals and they go through quicker when you manage your pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just, it was lovely to have that task for the entire office. It was something that I kind of could really get submerged into. And uh, interestingly enough, I've, I've actually got a client who, does has sales progression software for estate agents and it, I was so excited when they got <laughs> in touch um but, but, but it was it was one of those things that now there's an online version we used to have paper-based systems uh, mm -hmm. and, and you'd have a chain diagram which was often stapled pieces of paper when it was a, a kind wow. of a really long chain but now with the use of technology a bit like you can use when I help people on the telephone there's so much information at a few clicks and actually information is ammunition. The more information you know about people, the easier it is to build rapport, how to influence them. It, it's, it sounds kind of manipulative, but it's, it's, true, like, meeting, it's like meeting your in-laws. Okay. When you meet your in-laws for the first time, you want them, you want them to love you. And you know, you've heard little snippets about the family, but you're on your best behavior. You're pulling out some of your best stories The Right. And mm. uh, yeah, it's just, I always say we, 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 when we go to, when we're allowed to go to the pub, okay, the way that you would speak and talk to people if you're at the pub with a group of friends would be very different from if you're at the pub taking your nan out for dinner. Okay. You'd, yes. you'd, right? your, your language may be more colorful over here. It might be more focused on family related stuff and ask checking she's okay and more attentive on this side. So we are kind of chameleons when we interact with people and it's not because we're being insincere. It's usually because we're trying to mirror what we think somebody else expects from us as well. Um, and is that the same thing that happens on the phone when you're talking to different people? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can go from talking to a <laughs> yeah, I always, when people are recruiting and they kind of go, oh, if we're going to recruit, what, what would you what would you say is a good skill to look for when you're recruiting somebody to be on the telephone? And I usually say somebody who's well spoken. OK, you're well spoken. It tend, it does tend to help you on the phone. But mm -hmm. what I mean really by well spoken actually isn't sounding posh. It's being polite and having kind of really good manners and etiquette and I know people who are real South Londoners I've guys up in the city who I've worked with um uh, there, there's one guy in their office and he talks like an absolute geezer he sounds like he's down the market mate it's all apple and pears all right uh he calls himself the big m right and he just phones but it works for him his clients like it, it, it right and and then there's other people in there that when I talk, I, you, I'll probably reveal this shortly. I talk about getting permission to speak and I've got quite a set way that I do that. But I've got mm -hmm. I've got people who I've trained who kind of have their own version of it. And that quite often is what I end up doing with people is I give them the confidence to feel like they're not being salesy and they're not coming across like they're pitching or they're a cold caller. OK, you give them a little bit of structure to follow so that the conversation can go off on a tangent, but you at least come back to the purpose of what you're trying to get from yeah, the phone yeah, call. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you chunk down your sales process. It's very rare that most of us have that one off Trans, um, interaction with a client where you meet them, you build rapport, they agree to buy from you straight away, you get it booked straight in the diary. It just doesn't all happen in one conversation. And sometimes you kind of need to, to pace yourself. And I think that's where a lot of people go a bit wrong um, is they're too busy rushing to a close. 
Yeah. Um, so, so my philosophy is I get, I get booked a lot uh, as a sales trainer or sales speaker. Um, and I always say, well, I, I don't teach people how to sell. Um, I just show them how to help their customers to buy. It's very customer service focused. And some people think that that's just a play on words and it genuinely isn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. If somebody is not interested, okay. Sales will always be a numbers game, but it is not about um, overcoming objections or convincing people to buy. It's more about, oh my. Yes. in my mind, it's about capitalizing on the conversations people are ready to have. I love what you said. And, uh, and in a moment, we are going, I want to understand your process when you're on the phone. I'm really curious to dive deeper into that. But I had a conversation yesterday because uh, um, like from the moment we are recording this episode is yesterday. And uh, I went on the phone to cancel uh, the contract with the EE because with the EE, you, you cannot cancel the contract online. Okay. You must call them to cancel the contract. Yep. Of course, they will do everything in their books. Absolutely. They should probably and, have three or four mechanisms to try and oh follow my, you up. Just to... Oh my God. Like I ended up almost like shouting to the guy, like, can I just cancel my bloody contract? Yep. Because it was like, so you want to cancel this contract? How much are you paying with this other one? What are you doing with here? How much are you paying for your broadband? It's been a long day. I just want to cancel my freaking contract. Yeah. I wasn't ready to have a conversation about switching provider. I didn't want to switch provider. So even just the question of, hey, would you like to switch? Or how happy are you with your brand? But something like that. And respecting yeah. my answer would have done it. Yeah. But it pissed me off so much yeah. that I was like, Oh my, so that was like, it's fresh right now. The yeah, trauma. Well, and that's probably um, almost a, a bad etiquette and tone from their perspective, because it, what, what it sounded like it felt like to you is that they were being quite evasive and not try, not doing what you were asking them to do, as opposed to trying to package it up to say, I am so sorry you've had to phone us and you want to cancel, but I would love to understand what we've done wrong or what we could have done better or anything we might be able to do to try and make it up to you that may not be that, that may not be possible but could you just explain it yeah would have made, it would have just framing that way it would have made a difference which is yeah. the importance of relationship and words yeah. um so let's talk a bit more about your sales process uh, uh, when you train uh, uh, actually now let's look at like from your perspective Let's say you would, there are a lot of speakers that want to get booked as a speaker or to get to win training. And uh, I know you practice what you preach, <laughs> which you have a lot yeah. of great relationship on. Uh, so let's le see if someone is a coach, a speaker or a trainer, how can they use their phone or phone calls to get booked and how would that conversation look like? Okay. Um, so I describe prospecting, particularly when you're using a phone call, um, is I always say it needs to feel like you're dropping off a pizza menu. OK, so what I mean by that is most most of us in the UK are used to getting takeaway menus put through our letterbox um, from all the local pizza companies, takeaways. I know that we have Deliveroo and it's probably slowing down now, but it's something that we're all kind of used to. Uh, and the story, which I'll give you the short version that I give on stage, is that I can recall leaving, uh, going out to my car back when we were allowed to go places. Okay. Uh, and, and my house, I live in an old Victorian house so that the door, the front door is on the side of the property. So I have to walk up the side to get to my car parked at the front. And on two occasions, as I was coming out the door, the Domino's guy uh, who had a menu in his hand kind of came around the corner at exactly the right time as I was coming out. Um, and on both occasions, he literally just waved it at me. As soon as he saw me, he just went, oh, I'm just dropping this off. And he literally waved it, so I'm not selling anything, I'm just dropping this off. And I very graciously said, thank you very much. And I'll be honest with you, I even recognize him because he's the delivery driver. OK, I don't eat that much pizza, I'll be honest with you. OK, uh, but we even had that little nod of evening, uh, morning. Thank you. I took that. And we both then walked away. I walked back to my house because uh, next to my door is just past it is where the recycling bin is. And it went straight in the recycling. But I took it graciously. OK, and the point I want to make is, is we've all or most of us have had these pizza menus put through our letterbox. But I bet none of you have had that person dropping off the menus, knock on your door and try and take an order. Could you imagine that if you got a, you open the door and they go, oh, hi there. Uh, can I uh, take your order? 
<laughs> right? That would just be cheeky. And like most people, when I say this, they have that same reaction to you where they almost laugh as if to go, oh my God, that would be so cheeky. Um, but there are people, particularly with some of the boiler room type businesses I've worked with in the city, where they laugh and have that same reaction. And then I say, now let's listen to some of your cool recordings because that door being slammed in your in their face is the equivalent of you getting the phone slammed down on you in that same space of time. So let's try. And once you start to highlight that your job is to create awareness, not convince people or, or badger them into buying. And so my strategy is you're going to go and drop off a pizza menu, which is to share a case study OK, that hopefully they can relate to. So I always say the best way to perfect your pitch, no matter what you do, if you're a lawyer or a landscaper, it makes no difference at all. The best way to perfect your pitch is to share a success story people can relate to. OK, let a happy mm. client speak for you. OK, uh, so what I typically do is, is when I start working with clients. So if you want some how to's or the practical element to this. Yeah, is that I'm thinking like, how do you apply because I understand the use of case studies uh, when after you have the con or the initial conversation. Yeah. But you're talking about using the case study actually during the initial conversation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. so the pizza menu drop off isn't as you would think it, i.e. me saying, hi there, here's a list of my services and prices. OK, I, I don't mean that's not what I mean by dropping off the pizza menu. It's a awareness drop off of a pizza menu is kind of what I mean. What I'd like you. So, for example, if I um, so I do coaching with all sorts of business owners, but I do work with some speakers. Uh, Simone, if I wanted to approach you um, mm -hmm. and try and sell you my services, mm -hmm. what I would probably do is I would typically go for low hanging fruit. So hopefully we'd have a mutual connection or you might know who I am or we, right. And I would reach out to you and say, hey, hey. Hey, Simone, we've connected on LinkedIn recently. Um, I just wanted to have a conversation with you at some point. I know that you coach other people already, um, but I, from what I gather, you do have a coach or two of your own. Um, you're True. probably not looking for a coach right now, but as you're a speaker, could I share with you two mini case studies of speakers I've been working with more recently who are trying to get, one's trying to get more speaking work, one's trying to get more training work. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and it's literally uh, not I'm I'm not trying to say, are you hungry? All right. All, all I really want to know is you wouldn't take the menu if you didn't think I might be hungry in the future. OK, uh -huh. so all I typically do is say, hey, there. And, and I, I get the, the most common objection out the way myself. I say, hey, Simone, I'm a coach. You're probably not looking for a coach right now, are you? Right. Because the, <laughs> no, most, common not. the most common objection when you're Absolutely. prospecting. Is, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we're not really interested in that right now. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. more annoyingly, they go, oh yeah, yeah, could you just email me? <laughs> <laughs> which which is which is like a polite way of saying, I'm too polite to hang up on you, but if I waste another minute or two getting you to send an email, will you leave me alone? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, so the with these the dropping off of these these sort of case studies. Um, the way you turn a testimonial into a case study, just to clarify this, yeah. where some people is uh, a testimonial is the quote that your client gives you. So it could be a lovely thank you email. It could be a LinkedIn recommendation. OK, mm -hmm. what I then do is I put that onto a one page PDF, but I start to give it a bit of context so that if I was to share it with somebody, they understand why it's relevant to them. So usually mm -hmm. at the top of the case study will be the type of business that they are. So it could be an IT business, a manufacturing business. It could be a retail outlet, luxury brand, whatever yeah. it might be. Underneath that is then the job title of the person who's written it. And this is crucial because if there's two things that you want to match, which would give you an ideal match and mean you must go and drop this pizza menu off, is if you can find another manufacturer. And uh, so let's just say it was yeah, the yeah, last yeah. time was a manufacturer, another manufacturer, and it was a HR director who booked you last time and you could find the HR director. I would phone them up and go, hey there, you're probably not looking for training right now. But if you are in the future, could I share with you what a HR director of another manufacturing company is saying about us right now? That's literally your starting point of the phone That call. is it. That's my whole, that's, that's my whole thing. I'll be honest with you. That's I can't brilliant. believe I've managed to ride out as a speaker this long. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah, uh, it, it takes all the boxes because uh, it handles the biggest object objection. Because mm -hmm. if someone is looking for training, most of the time, I found that they approach like when they need it, mm -hmm. they approach people or Absolutely. they ask, "Hey, I'm looking for training. Who do you recommend?" Yeah, 
or they will then look online and do their research. Yeah, uh, and, and it's very unlikely to find the right person, the right time from a person that they don't know, that never heard before to say, absolutely. I would really love to work with you. <laughs> well, 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 the other cl quite clever thing about assuming now is a bad time is what the majority of people do is they confirm the answer to they, they confirm that that is correct. Yeah, it then is they go, time. I'm busy right now. Or but, then they, but then they go on to justify it. They say, you know, you're right. We're not looking for training right now because we've got we're halfway through a 12 month project that's that's still being rolled out. Or actually, we're not looking for training right now because we don't get a new budget until April. Yeah. And all of a sudden, mm. as you drop off the pizza menu, because you're doing it in a nice, soft way, people kind of go, I am I am happy to take this pizza menu because I do eat pizza every now and then. And actually, I might be hungry in a month's time or I might be. And, and usually, and, and I would get straight to the point with this, as I would say to them, look, I'll happily sort of drop these off. But if we were looking for speaking work, I would say, when's your next event that's in the diary and how many weeks beforehand would you typically start looking at speakers because that's the point when i'd love to have a proper chat with you i'll send you a copy of my book okay mm -hmm. um I'll, we can set up a little zoom call or whatever it is uh, and i try and offer them what i would call a test drive so that's the next step to this process i i really love the process because that's a turn that's a uh, having a very short conversation mm -hmm. with the outcome not to sell but to build a relationship and to say hey this is who i am this is what i have let me just make sure that i can contact you at the right time so what i'm hearing you saying is that the aim of the call of the first one mm -hmm. is to say when is the right time is to get the information when is the right time to contact you and how do you like to be contacted absolutely yeah yeah, pretty much. And, and when I boil down my structure, um, technically, there's there's three phases of the conversation or a, or a conversation. So the conversation could be a longer term, multiple conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, But typically, there, there's three phases and you do have to be aware of them and do them in, in the order. Okay, yeah. which is the beginning part of the call. You've just got to build rapport. Okay, or more importantly, don't turn them off. Don't set off any red flags that make them think it's a sales call and that they're not going to enjoy speaking to you. OK, so one of the best things you can do is be really super polite. And one of, I mentioned it earlier on, uh, you start your call by getting permission to speak, which the way I teach it is by assuming now is a bad time. So if I was to phone you, Simone, I'd be going, oh, good afternoon, Simone. My name's Anthony Steers. I was just hoping to chat to you for a couple of minutes, but I know you're a really busy guy. Um, I don't know. Is there a better time to call you back? OK, and I make it so easy for you to get out of this call that you're thinking this guy can't possibly be in sales because if he is, he's rubbish at it, basically. Right. He's not to be feared. And yeah. in doing that softly, softly approach, if people are genuinely busy and they go, actually, I've got a Zoom starting in three minutes time. You go, in which case I'll give you a buzz tomorrow. Is there a good window to catch you or right? I just like I say, capitalize on the conversations people are ready to have. It's much easier to move somebody on a good day in the right direction than it is to fight with somebody just because they've answered the phone and you need to hit your target. Um, what well, I'm curious is like, why if this method, like they get, keep on the phone and don't hang up until they say yes, is mm -hmm. so non-effective. Why is, has it been told and not so many people so use? It, it? No, so it, it can be effective. It's just now become too risky basically okay so what you're what 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 you're talking about there are two things that were quite common in sales training and in, in inductions and quite common for those in a telesales role yeah. and it is the combination of sales is a numbers game right each no is one step closer to your so next yes yes <laughs> Which is, I'm really sorry. Uh, man, right. I was, uh, I was uh, like my first sales training. I used to sell charities door to door. Okay. Oh, God, that yeah. was uh, so. I had the baptism of fire. Yeah. Going in the afternoon in winter time. <laughs> and my With your my last smile, your friendliest welcome. Right. My last door. My last door is at 10 p.m. So yep. literally until 10 p.m. with her out on the snow, knocking doors, and I worked there for about a year. But I stayed there because I knew that to be, to have my coaching business, I need to learn how to sell. And I didn't know how to sell. Yeah. And I was like, if I can go through the most grueling things, like if I make this work, yeah. all the rest becomes a piece of cake. And, yeah. and I remember uh, I had, and the train they were getting us to, to do is like, you stay in front of the door until they slam the door in front of you. 
or and I literally and it's also in my TEDx talk I actually someone leaving like a, a dog chasing me around the block that's another story <laughs> uh <laughs> it wasn't a good moment it was a big dog and I'm afraid of dogs so <laughs> But the uh, and You're the other part fit as a fiddle, my friend. <laughs> oh wow, my god! And the other part was like it is a number game, so you have to knock uh, your yeah. two hundred fifty doors during your shift, and yeah. you do them. Well, well, either you're thick skinned and you don't mind being hung up on, and you almost enjoy the 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 conflict that you get with some people and the back chat and the attitude some people actually thrive on it i've seen call centers where mm -hmm. there are people who will deliberately try and keep you on the phone there is no no go on it's a game of who hang who hangs up first as far as they're concerned if you hang up they've won mm -hmm. okay um <laughs> but it, it, yeah it's it, but the way that they combat it usually is they give you a script they say just keep reading yeah, this a hundred yeah. people will tell you to sod off but the, the one out of a hundred will say yes and we'll give you a hundred pounds okay um and that's just deadly and and the reason why i said um, earlier on that it, it can be effective don't get me wrong you throw enough mm -hmm. mud at the wall some of it will stick the reason it's so risky now is you upset the wrong person that's influential online not being funny mate but if somebody phoned you up that's true and really like so ee have aggravated you do you mind me asking have you mentioned it anywhere on a social media platform no but i i, I definitely did it with ryanair well, you, <laughs> a few you, times uh, yeah and and i got like fifteen thousand people on linkedin a few thousand on twitter uh, <laughs> absolutely so so all of a sudden yes. what you tend to find is that it's not worth the risk anymore because if i was to upset you and you started posting negative stuff about me i now have to create marketing not to help me make money and cre create clients to bury bad content so nobody finds it mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and and it just becomes too risky and i've i went through a phase many years ago i used to phone up the companies and say um i received a call from somebody today uh, if they are recording i suggest you listen to it that's a disciplinary in anybody's uh, in anybody's book but don't worry i've sent them a free copy of my book i don't think they, <laughs> they were phoning um and it's interesting because i've then received a call back from from the odd one who's gone i have listened to the call recording and and they are no longer with the business and mm. I, it's such a dreaded task and i think that in the back in the day telesales was a stepping stone to field sales and proper sales and working your way up yeah. whereas now particularly for a lot of us who run our own businesses it's not telesales it's just running your own diary and filling your own diary hmm. um I, I have a question for you actually uh, around uh, around social selling because hmm. now with uh, social media platforms uh, a lot of times like uh, there is a step before the call so do you see cold calling prospects still a thing like done on his own or is that evolved with the ability to build a relationship with them or contact them on social media like how are you integrating the two if you are integrating them yeah so it, there is definitely um some integration there the one thing i would say is there's no such thing as cold calling anymore. Cold calling is dead. Cold calling was sitting there with the yellow pages, having nothing mm. but the name of a company and a phone number and trying to sell something. All okay. Right. Um, you, you no longer have the excuse to say you couldn't find any information about them before you phoned. Mm. And that's one mm. of the things that mm. frustrates me the most is when people phone me up to try and sell me something and I go, fantastic. So how would that apply to my business? And they don't actually know anything about my business. So I'm saying, so how are you thinking you're going to tailor this pitch to me by giving me broad headings of features and benefits? It just doesn't work. So, yeah. yeah uh, so the, the, the amalgamation of the two, LinkedIn is probably the platform that I use the most. Um, it's where I ask for my recommendations. That's where I try and gather up my testimonials. Um, purely because once they're on there, um, if you write me a lovely testimonial, um, there's a chance that one or two of your connections will look at my profile off the back of seeing you've written something nice mm -hmm. about me. Um, so if somebody did look at me, I would do a spontaneous phone call to go, oh, hello there, Johnny. Sorry for the random phone call, but I can see you've been looking at my profile on LinkedIn and I noticed you're connected with Simone, who I've done a lot of work with. Did you read what he wrote about me? Is that how you found me? And I just reinforce that good, lovely thing that you've said about me. Love and it. the beauty of mm -hmm. this and this uh, pizza menu or case study drop off is that 
most of us, particularly most of us who are experts, the bit that we really struggle with is, is the bit where we have to tell people how good we are. Mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. we cringe then because it feels like we're boasting or we're, or we're trying to sell to them and actually yeah. just let your clients speak for you right document the results share and if you're worried about asking for testimonials at the end of a of, of helping somebody at the end of a training program after a speaking gig whatever it is when they come up to you and say thank you okay that's a verbal cue that's a sign of gratitude that's your cue to say you are very welcome i'm really glad you're happy with it as you've been so happy, would you mind sharing just a couple of lines of what I've been like to work with? Love it. Love okay. It. Um, mm. Yeah. Now it is uh, it is incredibly powerful because now you are using basically the testimonial from your network to get in front of other relevant people yep. with uh, uh, leveraging the recommendation that you have. And I was talking, I was thinking about even like uh, the, the way you approach people because uh, I don't do like I only have. Uh, phone calls actually if someone books a call okay and yep. and that's why i was really curious about this conversation because i generally don't call up people say hey this is the research i've done but i would yep. use the very very similar structure on messages yeah where i would say hey like i'm just thinking like my linkedin outreach uh, is hey over the past few years we've been working with x number of people this is the result that we got uh, we have some resources on how to get featured on forbes and major publication are you interested if yes uh, respond here yep. if no have a great day yeah and so there is nothing that it's not an action they have to do is just is this relevant for you if yeah, not yeah. it's it's a bit like that that blend with linkedin because some people say should i send somebody an invitation before i phone them so technically yes you can but i i usually phone people up to ask if i can send an invite because it's so polite that nobody ever says no and they accept your invite, <laughs> and they accept your like... invite very quickly what you've actually uh-huh. identified is you, you what we've done there really is highlight the fact that you are so good at your job and that you have these funnels that you work because the crux of it is is you only make outbound phone calls when you haven't got enough inbound inquiries to deal with or existing clients okay so yeah no it's like it is even even when i didn't have enough um i used to do my outbound mm-hmm. via messaging and I, i'm looking at even the structure of the messages and the nature of the conversation they are very similar to the one that they have on a call on, on in yep. person but definitely they when you hear their voice like yep. the connection that you create with someone on a call yep. is like having an hour of yep. message, text messages, conversation and, and so on. So yep. definitely like on a so human as, connection, it's way as more a, powerful. As a test that I, I would love you to do, and I imagine the reason that you do it is because you are so busy. I know how how much stuff you have kind of going on. So time is is really precious. But my guess would be if you did a webinar or some kind of funnel where you got a hundred names. Mm-hmm. If you were to um, uh, send out an email to those 100 to say, I, yeah. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. If you'd like to book a free one-to-one with Simone, uh, follow this link and you can book into his diary. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If you sent out a hundred, I don't know, you might, would you get two, three, four, five, maybe sign uh, up? If, if they have already attended, the webinar is about 20%. So okay. about over a hundred, we got 20. Okay. But if okay. they've already attended the webinar, my, my if the guess is a different thing. That if, if, if you split those a hundred people and you sent 90 an email saying, set up a call, you would hope maybe you get 10 people sign up. Yeah. My guess would be if you were to phone up the remaining 10, and say, I, call, I, I, I find you and said, mm-hmm. hey, Simone, uh, I, I know that you were on the webinar earlier on. Please don't think that I'm trying to sell you anything now. But now I've had a chance to look you up on LinkedIn. You're really similar to a couple of clients. And I'd love to, if you want to, to help you a bit more. Um, if you're interested, and I don't offer this to everybody, um, I'm more than happy to do a one-to-one 20-minute coaching session. And all I would ask for in return is that within a week or two, if you could write me some feedback of what happened as a result of implementing any of my advice, that's all I would really ask for. But if you wanted more after that, I can certainly show you how the, my programs work. I like it. I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. Well, I, I just think that if you, give it a go. you sent 90 emails and made 10 phone calls, I think you'd probably end up with the same number of bookings and the amount of time. Yes, you can broadcast lots of emails with a few clicks, but you still have to set up that email. Um, mm-hmm. and a phone call, not being funny, but 
it's lovely to hear you and the recordings and read your stuff, but yeah, yeah. to have a one-to-one -one conversation with you is very it makes, different. It makes a huge um, difference. It makes yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give it a go. Like I remember when uh, is actually when we were running events at the beginning, uh, we didn't have like email reminders or text messages. Uh, I do the best I can to, uh, as part of our process, when people register, I have personal conversation over text with people before they okay. attend. And I found that our attendance rate is actually quadrupled yeah. because, uh, and people buy because they say, I had a conversation with you, but yeah. I'm going to test instead of having even the text message, I'm going to give a couple of, not to everyone, say if yeah. I, but I can see and have phone calls with some people. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm aware of time because uh, I have two questions to ask you before we wrap up and I've got okay. six minutes before I have a sales call actually. Okay, so <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> talking about selling. So yeah. uh, I, Question number one is, uh, do you find that the US approach and the British approach are different in terms of the sales side? Because uh, I've been hearing a lot of comments on this topic. I want to hear your opinion. Um, I don't have a huge amount of experience with American trainers, um, uh, but typically Americans are very optimistic people. We, in Britain, we like to moan. Over there, they like to positively think about what could happen um i there is a lot it does seem to be a few years behind and some of the more old-fashioned sales tactics number 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 type thing throw enough mud at the wall and some will stick tends to be more what i i see from over there but i would i i think it's it's down to the individual really yeah no, it, it's but interesting traditionally when i hear people talking about american trainers or sales trainers they're usually talking about them being very happy clappy too energetic almost forced and false whereas what most people want is just the confidence to break the ice and have a a human conversation not mm. deliver a pitch with panache which is what some of I, I, I love what you're saying because, and I, I got this question because uh, uh, we're running quite a lot of rooms on Clubhouse, uh, and a lot of the clients that buy from us, which is really interesting. I'm Italian, I am British, but I, they actually say, "Oh, like we, we actually a lot of people say we buy from you because you are not American." And not into against, like, we have a huge American audience, yep. but um, and it goes me to the next. Uh, which is just like a different style or a different approach. Yeah. Um, and not to say, because I know a lot of great American trainers that actually have yeah. a, an approach, which is a design conversation. So I don't want to go into American, British. It's like, it's more about the approach yeah. rather than where are you from? Yeah. Uh, but there is a book that I've been recommended, actually. I just bought it. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever read it. It's called Don't Sell, We Are British. Rules for persuading people who don't like to be sold to. I like. I haven't even heard of that, but I like the sound of it. I'm. I. I just bought it. We had the. We had the room on Clubhouse um, with the best books recommend, and there was someone that recommended that book. As soon as she mentioned it, yeah. I went on Amazon and book it is on the way. Straight away. Right. So I'll send you the link and I'm Please curious to have a conversation about what you think about it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like I say, sounds very much my cup of tea. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, last things to wrap up. What is uh, the tool that you would like to recommend people uh, that have been listening? And then after that, how can people reach out to you? Okay. Um, so I'm um, not very good with technology. Uh, obviously, I'm speaking a lot more. I do have cameras, microphones, lights everywhere. I, I now have a studio rather than an office, as I like to call it. Um, but the, the best tool that I've got and has helped me run my business and do my job well is a notepad. It's, it's what I would refer to as my day book. I, Can I put a sound effect? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Here you go. Um, and basically, as I mentioned earlier on, information is ammunition. And most of us are not really that interested in other people unless they're going to help us. So we don't usually pay full attention when somebody is talking. Uh, but a great way to build rapport with people and certainly to build trust is to really pay attention and take lots of notes. So I all of our, every conversation that I have gets written down and, and at the time of the call, um, how long that call lasts. Yes, it gets transferred onto my system, but I've got a paperback system that I've got a whole chunk of all of my old diaries and pads. And actually, yes, I have an official system, but mm. just having a pen and pad 
whether I'm in the car when I have to, if a, if a call comes in, I can pull over and I can scribble down notes or when I'm talking to people, just write everything down. OK, it's better to have written it down and not need it. OK, then think, oh, God, what was the name of their kid? They did mention it twice and I forgot to ask because they were having a recital and I need to ask how it went or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the best tool that I can recommend. And it's not really going to cost you very much. at Man, all. I, I'm thinking about uh, like one day when you will retire, if you will retire. Yeah, there can be like the published version of Steers Diaries. Oh. Or so. <laughs> Oh, we don't... <laughs> no, I'm joking. How can people reach out to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's move away from that one. Um, my, my, my writing is designed to hide spelling mistakes. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's for a code. My wife says you write in code. Uh, so for people that want to contact me, uh, you can just Google the telephone assassin. Uh, the full top page, you will find lots of stuff about me. Uh, the the telephone assassin.co.uk is one of the websites. You can look up Anthony Steers.co.uk. Um, but connect with me on LinkedIn. It's the platform that I'm most active on. I would love to hear um, what you've taken out of what we've said today. Uh, quite often, Simone, we don't have a huge amount of time when we can talk and we've got so much more we can cover. I'd love to know any little nuggets that people have put into practice or something that sort of changed the way they think about making these calls. Um, my number is very easy to find. I'm not going to give it to you right now because you have to do a little bit of work. This is part of the fun of making phone calls, but my phone number is very easy to find. Um, you call me on my mobile. I would love to talk to you. And if you tell me you listen to this podcast, you can have a free 20 minute coaching call. That's brilliant. So we'll put all the details uh, in the show notes. Make sure you reach, reach out although, to Anthony. Although the Americans, you do have to wait until uh, time zone wise it works. It needs to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't call him at five o'clock in the morning or one yeah. yeah, because yeah. he might don't be sleeping. Don't call me at the end of the day, please. I will probably be sleeping, but, but thank <laughs> he might, you. He might be sleeping. <laughs> but thank uh, you for having me on, Simone. It's been brilliant. I love chatting with you. I, I love this interview and I think for everyone, like the ability and to just have the confidence to make a phone call, knowing that you're doing it in the right way. Because a lot of people don't make that because they, they feel like they don't know if they're doing it right. Yeah. And so just having the ability and the confidence to do it right, then it will unlock a lot of struggles or block that you have around the topic. So if, if you know that is something you're dealing with right now, make sure you reach out to Anthony. All the, um, uh, the details are in the, uh, um, are in the show notes. We haven't mentioned during the interview, but uh, Anthony is also uh, the president of uh, the Professional Speaking Association, the London chapter. So is, is our president uh, in our chapter. Mm -hmm. And as well, so if you're interested in uh, uh, becoming a great speaker or becoming a professional speaker, Public Speaking Association, the PSA, the Professional Speaking Association, the PSA, make sure uh, you reach out and we'll put also the PSA details in the, um, in the show notes. Anthony, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Simone. Have a great evening. I look forward to speaking soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here today and uh, or tonight, whatever time zone or whatever time of the day you, you are listening or watching. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast, you haven't subscribed to the show. What are you waiting for? I mean, you see the gold that we give. So click the juicy subscribe button right now and also leave us a review and let us know what you enjoy the most about this episode. Until next time, remember that together we grow exponentially. Ciao.